Cool. Well, let's, let's get stuck in. First of all, Kevin, man, I'm really, I really appreciate you making the time. I, I really enjoyed, um, I watched your, your, I don't know if it was your first documentary. I was looking at IMDb. You look like you've been involved in a few things, but I watched your first documentary that I uh, came across Hellbound uh, years ago now, and I absolutely loved it. Um, I was so excited when you uh, produced this new documentary. But why don't you tell um, people a bit about maybe who you are, uh, what you do, other than maybe documentaries and right, maybe yeah. a little bit on that. But just to give it people an idea of who you are, because I feel like I have a rough idea of who you are. I've been following you online for a little while now, but I know for many people, they, they, the, the, I guess one of the natures of being behind the camera is a lot of people don't know who you are. Um, and so, yeah, if you want to give yourself like a bit of an intro, a bit of a uh, bio. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Um, I always like to lead out by saying I grew up on a farm in rural Saskatchewan in Canada. So I, I you know, always consider myself a bit of an unlikely person to be doing what I'm doing, uh, especially, you know, making a film, JAS USA, which looks at, you know, uh, Christianity in the United States. Um, but, uh, you know, it, uh, I think growing up in that kind of a, in, in that kind of a world, uh, it gives you a little bit of an outsider's perspective on mm -hmm. life. Um, I also grew up, I was uh, adopted and I grew up in a family, uh, mixed racial family in terms of some of the children. Uh, a bunch of us were adopted and brought into this family and that kind of put us a little bit on the margins uh, as well in terms of the community. So I think I kind of naturally developed an observer's perspective, um, you know, because of sort of that, that upbringing. Um, but yeah, I, ever since I was young, I, I knew I wanted to be involved in some kind of a creative endeavor, and, uh, specifically in terms of writing. I grew up wanting to be a great Canadian novelist. Um, I, as I got into my adult years, I realized, you know what, uh, being a novelist in Canada is a, uh, you know, you got to subsist on government grants and all this kind of stuff. If I want to write, <laughs> why don't I go into film? You can actually make some money in film. Um, so I made that transition. I was really fortunate. Um, uh, I actually had my first film made, I think it was 2006. It was a little low budget horror movie uh, called After. And uh, that got some, uh, you know, what, just getting a movie made in the film business is, mm, is like yeah. the best thing that can happen. It doesn't even matter if it's any good. It's the fact that somebody made a movie based on your script. So the next person's not going to be the first person to take a chance on you. So I um, got hired from that. It's a weird transition going from a little horror, indie horror movie to working on a documentary with Ben Stein. It was, it was called um, Expelled. And it, it was a film that asked the question, um, uh, you know, intelligent design was sort of just on the rise at that point, which is this idea that uh, evolution may have happened, but it may, is it possible to detect any signs of intelligence in the natural world that would point to some kind of a designing hand mm -hmm. in the process of evolution? So the question is, is that science or is that just religion, um, kind of a Trojan horse attempt by religion to sneak back into the classroom? So that's what the film looked at. I'd never at that point, uh, I'd never worked on a documentary. I'd maybe kind of watched documentaries as a passive observer. Uh, but here I suddenly find myself a writer, uh, mm. like the sole writer on a multi-million dollar film, having no idea what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> but uh, thankfully, other people around me did and kind of held my hand and taught me a lot of things. And that film had some success. So uh, one documentary led to the next, to the next, to the next. So I ended up working on a lot of films. Hellbound, the movie you referenced earlier, was the mm. first film that I directed. Um, so, okay. you know, being a writer, especially when it comes to documentaries, you don't have a lot of power. You're, uh, uh, the people who have the power are specifically the people who work in the editing room because that's really where the film comes together. So I, I taught myself to edit uh, and learn from, you know, some of the people I worked with. And then eventually I just, you know, took on the role of director, producer, um, just because it was almost by default. I had this vision to make a film uh, that really asked, kind of similar to Expelled, it took a minority position within Christianity, which was universalism, and asked, why is this so controversial uh, mm. within evangelical Christianity? It was around the time that Rob Bell, coincidentally, had released Love Wins. Yep, and so sure. it was the perfect time. Everybody was coming out of the woodwork, lining up on one side or the other. So it was a great time to investigate that question. And mm. uh, yeah, so I kind of became a director, producer by default. And uh, so JES USA, uh, I've, I've worked on some films in between, uh, Hellbound and JES USA, but this is kind of my next, um, you know, film that kind of returns to some similar material. I kind of call sure. it a quasi sequel to Hellbound because Hellbound, it also, in addition to looking at hell, it really looked at the issue of violence, um, mm. both divine violence, human violence, and, and how do we find a satisfying solution to all the injustice in the world? Um, yeah. so this, this film, I think kind of continues that conversation.
That's so cool. So, I mean, I was going to ask that these, these seem so connected in some ways, and yet um, you might take a not far enough step back and, or, or, or maybe go close enough to it and go, oh, these are quite different topics. The topic of hell, the topic of, um, of can violence be a sacred act? Um, you know, in, in some senses, very overlapped, and in another sense, it's totally different topics. Like, is this a kind of area of interest that you've been kind of pushed towards um, kind of internally, or is this something that um, you know, you saw like a gap in the market and you were, oh, someone needs to produce something on that because there isn't something there or, do you know what I mean? Is this, is this something that's just burned in, in you or something that's been worked out within you? Like, were you already um, maybe within those minority positions and thinking someone needs to talk about this? No one's, you know, yeah. what, what, was, what was your reasoning behind kind of coming up with some of these documentaries? Yeah, well, no, I definitely wasn't uh, looking at the market and seeing a gap in the market. And because uh, I'll tell you right out, out of the gate, you don't make any money making these films. I mean, uh, yeah. the people who invest in these films, <laughs> they do it because they feel passionate about the subject matter. Yeah. And that definitely begins with me. So Hellbound came from me wrestling. Really, I became a, a you know born again Christian when I was nine years old, when I went to a Bible camp and was given a gospel presentation that included you know, if you die, you're going to go to hell. And of course, you no, know, what nine year old wants to go to hell. Yeah. Um, and so I said, yes. And, but yet that always, I always look at, you know, my conversion as being, um, it was like a virus snuck in with it, you know, and uh, mm. it, it started to overwhelm the host, this idea of, of God's final answer to evil being sequestering and possibly torturing um, the majority of humanity for eternity. It mm. just doesn't seem like a very satisfying answer it doesn't seem like a very interesting God um, that's part of that story. So there's just this instinct inside that I had that there has to be a better way to resolve this. Yeah. And it was really, you know, I always go back to my friendship with Brad Jerzak is one of the, the biggest transforming relationships of my life because I, I was working in publishing. Uh, this would have been back in 2008, 2009. I was editing books and I edited book, a, Brad, a book by Brad called Her Gates Will Never Be Shut, Hell hope in the new Jerusalem. And what Brad did in the book was something really simple. He said, well, we have this idea of eternal conscious torment in hell. It's kind of being sold as the tr traditional position and really mm. the only legitimate position for a Christian to hold. Is that true? So what he does in the book is he systematically examines every possible reference to something akin to hell in the Old Testament. Turns out there is no reference to it. And then he looks at the same thing in the New Testament uh, as well as different images of divine punishment. And mm. and then he also looks at what are the interpretive traditions within the history of the church. And what you come away from uh, by doing that simple study is that there is no, you know, compelling, uh, you know, one view only yeah. um, that, that comes out of that type of a study. In fact, there's a tremendous amount of diversity and freedom to read and interpret texts in different ways. And wow. for me, that was just really transformative because I f finally felt like I'd been given permission yeah. to... Uh, think differently. And what followed from that, of course, is then re-examining the atonement. Why did Jesus die? Because I'd been raised within a tradition that said he had to pay a sacrifice to satisfy God's wrath against sin. And, mm. and so then we need to accept that or else we have to pay it for eternity in hell. Well, that's not satisfying either. So that, you know, once, once you question hell, then goes penal substitution and the whole thing falls apart. Sure. And that's why I think people are very afraid to question these types of things. You know, I, there's a guy, I can't remember his name, uh, a friend of mine, John Stackhouse, was, uh, John Stackhouse is one of my pros, I went to seminary, and he's uh, an author of note and a theologian, and uh, he's, you know, quite a public theologian, he's written for a lot of popular audiences, but he was just uh, uh, criticizing David Bentley Hart's very critical review of this 1400 page book that basically tries to demolish universalism, and mm. it's, it's an utter travesty of a book, but one of the main arguments that this guy has is if universalism is real, it in a sense guts uh, the moral imperative of Christianity. Basically all of Christianity falls apart. So what that tells me as kind of what I concluded when working on Hellbound is that like it or not, for many, many Christians, hell is the foundation. Yeah. And, and that as yeah. Brian, uh, Brian McLaren says in Hellbound is that what Christianity becomes is just a hell avoidance plan. And yeah. so um, it's inherently self-centered. It appeals to our fight or flight mechanism. And to me, it's the antithesis of the gospel which the gospel um, is something that is supposed to be calling us toward love of God and love of others and to self-sacrifice, even in the face of, of evil and violence when it's brought against us. In fact, especially in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. And because what is our ultimate goal when confronted by an enemy? It's to 
save the enemy from themselves and from the evil that they have fallen prey to and to the fear primarily, because we're all, you know, we only act in violent ways in response to fear. And so, um, Anyway, uh, I'm on a long rabbit trail there, but no, this is but really great. Cool, but, but that's, I guess that can answer the question of how did yeah. I get on this path? This is very much, the films I make are very much of me trying to work out these things that I'm, you know, churning away within my own mind and making a film like Hellbound or a film like JES USA is a great way to test drive an idea um, yeah, because absolutely. you can go around the world and talk to some people who devote their lives to thinking about these things, some of whom agree with you, some of whom do not agree with you at all. Mm. And you're having to read, you know, before I go interview somebody I'm reading and, you know, just, I mean, you know, before I interview somebody like David Bentley Hart, I literally read almost every book that oh, he's man. ever published as well as a bunch of articles <laughs> by him and about him and critiques of him. And, you know, so you're it's a lot you, of prep. Yeah. And you really have to, but you're subjecting these ideas you have in your brain against a very strong sounding board mm -hmm. and so uh and then putting the film out in public and you know people start to react with it engage with it it's a great opportunity to kind of um figure out are you on the right track or have you been led mm -hmm. astray and what parts of your thinking are are good and what part maybe do you need to do some more investigating on so yeah. it's a it's a real privilege uh to be able to you know how many people get to spend that much time doing that sort of thing so it's, it's yes it's seriously oh I, I remember I remember watching, uh, I think it was the first time I watched Hellbound. So it's, I just gathered people every time. I was like, okay, I grab another five or six people and we'll watch this again. So I've probably seen it like 10 times. This is just one of the best resources I could think of. Like I'd read, recommend like Her Gates Never Be Shot or I'd say, you know, go read this this book here or that or, you know, uh, Christian Universalist or Evangelical Universalist or you know, all these different great books are out there, but no one's going to read a book. But they'll watch an hour and a half documentary every time right. um right. you know we love it sitting in front of a screen any excuse you know yeah, um, yeah. so I, I i've seen it so many times but i remember at one point maybe the first or second time i was watching i was like so many of these people are my heroes i'm like <laughs> so jealous of this guy that's filming this i had no idea who you were at the time I'm like he just gets to go around and hang out with these people and ask them questions that's, yeah that's amazing what a great opportunity um and so i can see that being very transformative if you're trying in, in and of yourself to kind of solidify where you're coming from where you're at um, that, that just seems like one of the, the most exciting, uh, ways to do it. You know, what, you know, I, I know that you read all the books, but in a sense, it's like, well, I get to read the books and then instead of sitting there mulling over how they would answer my question, I get to go and ask them the actual question. You right. know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't have to go and listen to eight podcasts, hoping that the guy recording it is going to ask the right question. I can just go and ask that guy the right question that I want to know. Um, yeah. so it must've been fascinating. Did, did you find, um, you know, you, you worked with such a broad spectrum of people. I remember seeing, um, you know, I'd see people come up and I'm like, oh gosh, I know that person is an annihilationist or I know that person is uh, a total conscious torment or I've heard that guy go on a big rant about universe. I'm like, I would not want to be in the room with that person. You know, and I, I'm not asking you to deal with dirt on anyone or anything like that, but do, was it quite intense at times, you know, dealing with people with such varied uh, views? You know, one thing I'm sure that you'll... Um, have experiences in my experience being a, a public figure talking about theology is the times that Christians get the most um, aggressive and violent towards people is when you touch their aggressive, violent God. In my experience, if I say God isn't violent or maybe there is no hell, never have I ever been more threatened with hell. Never have I ever been more threatened with aggressive, horrible things. I mean, really awful, awful things. Um, did you find that dynamic when people knew you were making a documentary about universalism? Did, did you tip off maybe the perspective you were coming from or any agenda? Like, how yeah. did that go about? Well, you have, you have to be, it's, it's always, we always call them the hostile interviews. So there's going to be uh, different interview situations where people, you know, that they're definitely, you know, they're, they're in a very different position than you are. And so how do you communicate with them and get them to agree to go on camera? And, you know, I have to credit <clears throat> those types of people for, you know, having trust um, it, that, you know, they're because they're putting themselves in my hands in terms of uh, editing. And, and I think a lot of people are afraid, oh, you just want to get me on camera, then you're going to yeah, you know, manipulate the footage and make me look like an idiot. But, you know, as a filmmaker, you're going to interview people because you really want to hear their point of view, not so you can distort mm -hmm. it, but so it, it can be communicated as clearly as possible. So my goal is always to you know, try and I, I don't like to create a hostile interviewing situation because I would rather have somebody um, just communicate as they would to a friend. And so yeah. that they're being frank and honest and clear 
because I think that helps everybody. It helps them, um, you know, communicate, and it also then helps uh, contrast other positions with them. And that's not to say sometimes things didn't get hostile. Like for instance, at one point during, I think I put my whole interview with uh, Mark Driscoll online, um, and uh, you know, there's a point at which he gets he gets angry with me yeah. um, because he accuses me of using uh, psychology. Um, anyway, uh, I could just you know, I could just tell this is a type of guy who it just suddenly dawned on him that I didn't agree with him. And so, mm. uh, that was upsetting for him, but yeah, I try not to create antagonist antagonistic situations. And, uh, you know, it's also interesting, uh, like for instance, in JES USA, we spent a couple of days with Sean Moon's church out in Newfoundland, Pennsylvania. And for people who don't know about Sean Moon, um, his church was famous for back in February, 2018, they did a marriage uh, rededication ceremony where couples would come and rededicate themselves, but they would also bring along a firearm, oftentimes an AK-47 or, or not AK-47, sorry, an AR-15, because they have this theology built around a rod of iron, which is what every king and queen should have to protect their land and all that sort of thing. And uh, I made this documentary, by the way, JES USA, with my, at the time, 18-year-old son. Um, hmm. He had gra graduated from high school three days later, we're on a plane and we set off and we spent the next several months filming. And so for him being in that environment for two days and for us having to kind of, um, you know, just um, not really, you know, kind of in a sense, just act like one of the crowd. It's very stressful. It's kind of like being yeah. undercover. Um, and it's not, and, and you know, the thing is, these people were super gracious to us in, in bent over backwards in any way. And, you know, they just took a real interest in us and, and were very kind. And, and of course, they're wanting to present themselves in the best possible light. Of course. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's still stressful because, uh, yeah, you're, 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 you're just sort of on eggshells. But, you know, I want to... Usually, usually the people you're pissing off aren't carrying AR-15s, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like, on a, yeah. some level, there's a bit of... <laughs> edge, yeah, I know. When you, yeah, when guns <laughs> enter the equation. But, uh, you know, I would, I would honestly say I would have no problem living right next door to this church because, uh, you know, these people aren't... Uh, they don't have firearms uh, as a form of aggression. They just feel... Mm -hmm it's their responsibility to protect. And so that's the, the, the reason to use them. And that's the thing is that you mentioned that, you know, you touch somebody's violent God and that's when you, you, you know, that's when things start to explode. I think the reason is, is because we don't, we're not violent. Most of us aren't violent because we are trying to be aggressive, to try and take something from someone, to destroy someone. We're violent because we're trying to protect something we love. And so when you question um, violence, you are threatening something that they love. And, yeah. and so there's a real shepherd mentality um, that a lot of people have. And so, and there's also just, we're beholden to certain types of logic. And so when you come along, you know, if the goal is survival, if that's the ultimate goal is, is survival, and you come along and suggest an action that could lead to self-sacrifice or destruction, you know, it just, it, you almost seem like a crazy person yeah. um, because you're operating from a, a completely different logic. But yeah. I believe that's what Christianity does. It is operating from a completely different logic. Yeah. That it is the inversion of, of uh, the way the world orders itself. You know, the world orders itself through violence. As Brian uh, Zahn says in, in JS USA, the lines on the map tell a bloody tale. And that that is how we order the world. But it's only Jesus that gives us the capability to imagine a new way of ordering things. Mm -hmm. and, and how does Jesus do that? Jesus does that by conquering the one thing that is really ordering the world and is the cause for violence, which is fear, specifically fear of death. And in, if you are living under the shadow of the fear of death, you are automatically in fight or flight mode. And um, self-preservation is is the prime operating principle. And so violence has to come into the picture. But again, what I think Christianity is trying to do, what Jesus is trying to do, what the gospel writers are trying to do is to emancipate us from that fear so yeah. that something new can enter the world. Yeah. And that's so and good. It, yeah. Interesting. Well, I, I'm really cheap back. Cause you know, on some level, you know, we're talking about, you know, this existential crisis of a sense of, we all are this terrified fear of death, uh, of, of not being, or of, of, of being in a very different state that is unpleasant maybe, um, for a lot of people. And, and, and in some senses, um, both positions deal with that. 
You know, um, you can, you would say that the average person uh, believing in an eternal conscious torment of fire, um, the average person believing that God is wrathful and violent and that he, he would even have us enact uh, sacred violence or just violence. Um, that person is no longer fearful of death because they have the certainty that, well, I'm on the right side at least. Um, and then the other person that has deconstructed this concept of sacred violence, deconstructed this concept of the need for justice to be punitive and, and allows justice to be restorative, they no longer have a fear of death for a whole nother uh, reason. But both have kind of dealt with the fear of um, death. But there's, a, there's almost, um, an, I'm cautious to say need, um, because I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to have both groups for quite a while, at least, uh, I believe. Um, but from my perspective, I would say that I have a desire to help people come from one perspective to another because I feel that it has an opportunity to be a lot more freeing and a lot more liberating and a lot more transformative to this world. And then to me, it's much more Christ-like uh, at the end of the day. Like it creates a better Christ-like picture of us and it creates a better Christ-like picture of God. Um, but I think the problem is to move from one to the other, you, you do have to put down that thing that saves you from a fear of death. And initially... If that's the only way that you're safe from this death, from hell, from whatever, to take that away is just terrifying. Um, it, is that something that you were aware of in a sense? Because this is kind of, in some sense, the journey you want your audience to take. You know, obviously, right. there's people like me that click go and, and Jesus USA, and I'm, I've got the popcorn ready. I know what I'm about to watch because I know you've got Brian Zand and, you know, Brad Jerzak and, who, you know, all these different people on, you know, Hellbound or Michael Harden. And a lot of these people are my friends. I've had them on this podcast or I talk to them every now and again. Like, I'm like, I know what I'm in for and I'm excited to watch it because I'm like, I'm the yeah. choir, you know, you're preaching right. to the choir here. But generally speaking, you're not making this for me. You're probably making this, hopefully, I would imagine to reach a whole bunch of people that are somewhere in the process or maybe entirely haven't started the process, but just to ask some questions. Is that something you're aware of, of like, uh, you know, as a director, as a writer, does it take, um, how much intentionality goes into how you craft this message, how you bring people on a journey in an hour and a half, two hours? You know, you, you don't have much time there. Right. Well, yeah, it's, time is a problem when you're dealing with a weighty theological subject um, to try and, number one, make a film about it, and number two, mm. try and say something s substantial in 90 minutes is tough. And, and there's always that line you're walking between, um, you know, substance, but also... I wouldn't say entertainment, but just engagement so that it's not yeah. so, you know, you want to engage people intellectually, but you also want to engage people emotionally. And, yeah. and, you know, you do that by featuring people who are characters that people want to spend time with. They become invested in those people and then they are more open to their ideas. Um, but yeah, in terms of an audience, I said to the investors early on, I said, you know, I really want to use um, Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth as a model because Al Gore I don't believe he made an inconvenient truth to convert people who didn't already think like him. I think he did it uh, to make a film that emboldens the choir and, mm. and legitimizes the instincts that people have and gives them the confidence to go out there and share these ideas. And I kind of look at Hellbound right. and J JS USA in the same way is that I think there's a lot of people like me who aren't satisfied with the story that they were given, but they don't know where to turn because they feel like turning away from that story is turning away from Christianity. Um, whereas I would actually say turning away from that story is finally finding Christianity. Yeah. Um, uh, but there's that just very real fear. And if it's backstopped by hell, well, you know, that's it's not worth it's, it. It just isn't, it's not, right? It's not worth it. It's scary. So you got to get rid of hell first, or at least this idea of eternal conscious torment in hell. And then you can start to examine these other things. So I'm, I'm not, I'm looking to, to in a sense make a film for people like you that can you can watch and share with other people but also yep. for people who might sort of be on their own maybe they're the only person in their friend group who's thinking this um, but this film gives them a chance to introduce them to people um, and and ideas that they might not have otherwise encountered I always say you know the films I work on I don't want them to be the last word on a topic I want it to be the first word um, or maybe just part of an ongoing conversation that they can take deeper with some of the people featured in the film mm -hmm. and, uh, and that sort of thing. So yeah, it's definitely made for people who are, you know, on their way out of a certain position, but they don't really know where to go, or they really need to be given permission to say, you know what, it's okay to question these things. Yeah. Christians have held a multiple 
uh, views on this topic throughout the history of the church. And yeah, they've excommunicated, they've excommunicated each other over this and that. But I mean, if you take it in some, you can be a Christian and have tremendous diversity. Yeah. And that's a good thing. And, you know, I just want to get back to, to the fear of death thing. I think you're right that, you know, however you answer these questions, it's a way of trying to solve the problem. Um, but the problem with holding on to something like hell um, is, uh, you know, that you're still in a, in a position of have you're still in a very defensive position because that is propped up on institutions and um, teachings and that sort of stuff that if threatened, the whole edifice of what you're standing on is yeah. going to collapse. So you're still in a very much a defensive posture. And you're also incredibly fearful for people who don't yet believe what you believe. Yeah. And so there's a tremendous amount of fear of death, maybe not for you because you think you're in the in group. Although, of course, how many believers really believe, you know, there's still going to be that little bit of fear in the back of the mm -hmm. mind. You know, I know I sure had that growing up uh, living under that. Um, and so there's kind of this just in case mentality, whereas I think if you really jettison this idea that God will ultimately answer the problem of violence with divine violence, or he'll answer the problem of your sin with, you know, just torment or uh, annihilation or something like that. If you're holding on to that, no matter what you are holding on to fear, whereas if you get rid of that idea, the freedom um, the tremendous freedom that comes from that, it's, it's really hard to describe because yeah. I don't fear somebody who doesn't believe in universalism. That's not a threat to my belief in that. Yeah. I rather feel, um, I don't know what I would feel toward that person, but I feel ho hope that perhaps that one day they will change. But I don't feel even a need to go out and convert them to my mm -hmm. way of thinking of things because I just feel you know, I, I think, again, Ernest Becker, who's a big influence on me, uh, his book, The Denial of Death, you know, we tend, he says that we tend to want to get a bunch of people onto our side because we're definitely afraid that, because that, in a sense, we, we need to have a lot of people believe in what we do um, or else that fear of death starts to creep up again, you know, mm. and so, but once that fear goes away, I don't know how to describe it, but except that what, what can you bring against a person? Yeah. You know? Um, nothing. And so I look at people uh, who disagree with me. I don't necessarily, I don't get angry necessarily. I get frustrated sometimes when I see uh, when it seems like um, people are kind of almost willfully resisting educating themselves about something mm. that's frustrating to me. Yeah. Um, but I don't feel, I don't take it a criticism personally. You, you know what I mean? Whereas, no, absolutely. yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. And, and again, it's not to say I'm above all that kind of stuff, but somehow that worry is just gone. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think that, you know what, I, I think that comes across so powerfully in uh, these documentaries. Again, it's so hard when you're watching documentary. I'm always, me and my wife watch documentaries nonstop. It's our favorite kind of genre of thing to watch. And I'm always aware that there is someone somewhere in a room that's going, this is the story I want to tell. So you always have to remind yourself of that. But even saying that, like just how people came across in that documentary, Hellbound, and again, in, uh, uh, I don't know, how do you say Jesus U.S.? You say, J, I, do you I, spell it out every time? or I spell it out every time, yeah. You do, J-S-U-S-A. Got it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's good. It's genius, by the way. You first announced that, I was like, that is so good. How has no one done that? <laughs> um, but, um, you know, what yeah. came across to me was I'm, I'm looking at different people presenting their positions, and I'm like, wow, this is a person that is deeply scared, really, really terrified of a different position being explored. And this is a person that is like, oh, it's okay. You figure it out. We've got time. It's okay. Don't panic. Take your time. Explore this. Figure it out. It, apply your intelligence. Pray about it. You know, pursue it with the spirit and, and that, the spirit will lead you into truth. And, and, and the other group is so terrified and tightly holding on to the right thing and, and don't you dare like let go, let go of it to entertain anything else and um, now that's maybe not true of every person in each camp or anything like that but i just right. that, that was something that and i think that does come across generally speaking when you explore these um groups of people people that are maybe eternal conscious torment versus people that hold more of a universal reconciliation or um universalism there's there's a lot more freedom there for sure and it, and it, it i think a huge part of it for me is to do with letting go of the fear of death 
um, you know, what, uh, to, to such a degree that I sure I didn't have a fear of death. I was quite certain I was in, but I was quite uncertain for everyone else. Yeah, <laughs> and, well, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that, that the thing that I, I started, I think it was probably Rob Bell's book that it was the first kind of um, thing, even though it basically said nothing. Uh, you know, it didn't really give me much of a, a direction at all, but it just gave the permission to explore yeah. that the, yeah. if the, if I was honest, nine times out of 10, whenever I speak on this, for example, people will come up to me and immediately say what you were saying. Like, oh, I was just looking for permission. I, I've always sat in the back of my head and gone, ah, I just can't believe that Uncle Bob's in hell. That guy was a saint. You know, that guy was amazing. He just didn't believe in Jesus or he didn't whatever, tick this box or that box or go to the right church or... But I never really believed it. And, and suddenly you, you realize that everyone's sitting there with their, yeah, but I'm not sure, but they're, they're not allowed to explore that. And I think creating um, avenues where people are allowed to explore is just so huge, um, really. Yeah. And, and your films are crafted that way so well. It's, I mean, that's why I was constantly filling my living room. <laughs> you know, I was, I was handing out a DVD everywhere. I'm like, here, you've got to watch this. And then they're passing on and I'm buying it again to pass it on. You know, it was, it was, it's such a great tool for that because you find that there probably are people like me where I'm like, Oh, I'm already there, but right. I have all my friends. That I, I can't convince them. I'm not the best with words and that's my job. So God knows about the rest of us, you know? Um, so like if we could just give something in people's hands, you know, and being able to write down the names of every person that comes up on the screen that you don't recognize and go and check them out on Amazon next or, or right, on right. Google or whatever. Um, it's an amazing, it's an amazing tool really. Uh, absolutely. Well, and I, I think what you say, like that, the whole concept of giving people permission is, is key because if you are, if you're so afraid of getting things wrong, because if you get things wrong, the consequences are just, you know, mm -hmm. astronomical. And so somehow finding a way to remove that fear, that, that is, I think the first step. And that that's true of everything. And I think Christianity, you know, uh, evangelical Christianity in particular is such a reflection of our current age, you know, that, um, you know, what is the, the worst thing you can do in politics is to believe something different mm -hmm. uh, or to change your mind. Oh my gosh, if you change your mind on a subject, yeah. you know, and yet I would hope that as we grow and mature as human beings, we should be changing our minds all the time because sure. we're learning things. We're seeing things from a different perspective. Oh, I didn't realize that, you know, and the worst thing you can do is point to a politician. I've voted the same way on this issue for 25 years. Yeah. I'm like, oh, oh he's you mean perfect to 18. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you haven't learned a thing in 25 years? You know, like you haven't moderated your position. You haven't, you know, it, it just makes no sense to me. But, you know, so very much Christianity, Christianity is always a reflection of its mm. age, um, of yeah. the times, but it's also a, a reflection of its history. And if you think about evangelicalism specifically, you know, within the 20th century, um, when we go back to the early part of the 20th century, uh, even really the late part of the 19th century with the rise of, of higher criticism, and just a, a re, and uh, you know greater discoveries about the context in which the Bible came to be, and the whole Near Eastern milieu, and what that has to say about our own scriptures, and how there might have been an interplay specifically between the Old Testament and some of the other Near, Near, East, Near Eastern cultures, and what does that mean? And then, uh, so evangelicalism just really develops a defensive posture around that mm -hmm. time, you know, with the publication of the fundamentals and all that sort of thing. And it's, you know, when it takes the wrong side in the monkey trials and, and it just increasingly finds itself going from, you know, evangelical Christians, um, were in the upper echelons of academia, you know, up until that point, but they become increasingly divorced from that and feeling, under threat from first of all academia then politics then the media then you know it feels like the entire world is against yeah. them and so that kind of just plays into a fearful mindset as well and so yeah. um you know it's it's just a we're all a product of our environment and um in our history and it's a big thing is is becoming aware of that yeah that you know don't we like uh, Greg Boyd says in Hellbound, he says, we tend to mistake the map for the territory. So we think that the tradition that we were raised in is the tradition. It is the only legitimate form of the faith. Mm. And um, so then we have to work hard to differentiate ourselves from others. Never mind people who aren't even Christians, but you know, really the worst enemy of the Christian is a different type of Christian. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, what, what does Freud call the narcissism of small differences, right? That we have to absolutely, 
you know, we work the hardest to try and separate ourselves from those people. But again, what are we doing? We're, we're operating out of a position of fear. Yeah. And so I go into making these films probably rather naively, especially with Hellbound, with just excitement and curiosity. You know, um, I had no idea how um, politically loaded this topic was and how, you know, how much it, problems it caused even for me personally, you know, within the church I was a part of, um, which we eventually basically were told that a certain point I got sat down and said, if I continued down this path, you know, they would have to issue public statements against me. Never mind wow. the fact that I'd actually sat my rector down prior to making the film and talking him through it. And he thought it was a great idea. Um, <laughs> so maybe he didn't really understand where I was going with it, but yeah, it's, uh, I, I feel that, you know, life is, uh, I kind of look at it this way, is that experience, if you think about the Wesleyan quadrilateral, there's four real, real ways to form a belief. You have, as a Christian, you'll have scripture, you have tradition, so some sort of interpretive mm -hmm. tradition of scripture, you have reason, and you have experience. And I really think that experience trumps everything. That um, it doesn't matter what you believe, because reality will run it over like a bulldozer. Mm. And so uh, once it does, you need to stand back and look at the wreckage and see what survived and what didn't. And whatever survived is worth keeping and whatever didn't, you have to let go. So yeah. what we're always looking for is like scientists is like a, just an increasingly um, accurate representation of the real world. Mm. And so with our theology, like our theology has to be fluid because our circumstances are continually changing. Yeah. And so that's what we should be looking for. So as a scientist, you know, a Christian scientist, what we need to be doing is, is like trying to disprove our theology all the time, yeah. just in the same way a scientist is trying to disprove their hypothesis to see, can it stand the test of reality? If it yeah. can't, we need to go back and, and form yeah. a new one. But that's a fun, exciting, investigative process. And that's what we should be yeah. engaged in, not trying to protect some edifice of theology. Just, you know, I, I remember, you know, uh, I just felt it was so arrogant that, you know, people in my, the church I was involved in saying that we hold the faith passed down through, you know, the fathers. So I'm like, yeah, but what if the fathers could have shown up now? Would they look at things differently? Like mm. the fathers weren't perfect. Yeah. The fathers were doing what we're doing. They're trying to sort things out in their context. And had they known something different, had Augustine been able to read Greek and Hebrew, he would have mm. thought differently. And, uh, you know, there's huge edifices of theology built on his, you know, uh, ingenious, but faulty ideas because he wasn't working with the original languages. So again, why, why don't we have freedom? Sorry, I'm kind of ranting yeah. there. No, this is good. I mean, this is, this is how I go. <laughs> um, so no, this is wonderful. Um, I, I, there's like a million different directions I want to go to. Um, I, I kind of want to bring things around to um, JS USA though. Um, yes. Which I think we're, we're touching on here and there, but I think this is, this is huge in it. You know, like we're talking about how um, everything we're, we're exposed to shapes our reality, shapes how we see things. You know, it's, it's at the end of the day, we're in this little bubble, you know? And so you're going to have people that are uh, Southern Baptists and go, well, we've always had the truth. Don't listen to, I don't know, the American Baptists, don't listen to the Methodists, don't listen to the Charismatics. You know, we've had the truth passed up all the way. And actually, you know, Augustine was a Southern Baptist, you know, whatever. Um, but we have these little bubbles. And I think, you know, one of the, the you know, you have the, the same privilege of being able to travel and, and, and meet people in different contexts. And so while a lot of us live in a bubble, we go to the same church, which is maybe it meets with other churches, but they have to kind of be the same sort of denomination or they have to agree enough to get together. And um, we kind of maybe travel a little bit, but we're going to stay within our kind of confines of what we're comfortable with. You know, we maybe go to Europe once in a while, but for the most part, we're staying in, you know, Northeast Georgia or whatever, you know, and that's right. it. And that's my world. And, and this is how the world works. And this is how everything works. And actually, a quick trip to New York, never mind to Rome, never mind to, you know, uh, Kuwait, uh, a quick trip to New York would blow your mind, potentially, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, and so um, that's one of the privileges I've had in traveling is I get to speak to all these Christian communities and, and deconstructing Christian communities all over the world. And, and you, you go into this part of the world and you go, oh my God, you guys have no idea that the things that you think are absolute and just the way they are, that's your little bubble. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I was just recently in January, I was doing a tour of um, Georgia and Louisiana 
Um, and you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm from the UK, I'm English, <laughs> oh, I'm Scottish, but I live in England. And I mean, we're probably the most progressive people uh, the average person in Georgia could ever imagine. You know, we're so far off the liberal scale, you know, it's horrific. Right. I don't know if that is how I would identify myself, you know, and, uh, but I was trying to explain to them in our country, the most right wing group would still be on the left for right. the average person in Georgia. You know what I mean? It, and I was trying to kind of explain that like, you know, these, once you step outside your bubbles, you realize, Oh, our right and left are almost identical. They're like over here on the right, on the cosmic gro- global scale or whatever. Um, right. And, and so there's this element of, you know, the whole, adage of like travel you know it's the best thing to kind of remove our prejudices to expand our horizons to open ourselves up to new ideas and, and philosophies and theologies um I, that was something that seemed to be such a core element of the whole uh JS usa you know like the, the the whole thing i moved to america and lived there for four years and i was in california but i was in redneck california I mean, right in the very like top northern border like uh, it was extremely conservative, which is fascinating for California. And, you know, guns and things like that. And I'm like, from Europe, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's Christians that are like bragging, pastors that are bragging, or if you come in my house, I'm going to shoot you. And I'm like, <laughs> what, what's happening right now? I, I, I've never met a single pastor that would promote any form of self-defense violence. Yeah, but That's literally how far off the deep end I am. And so something like JSUSA is so, like, you show that to the average person in the UK, and we're going to be like, yeah, well, duh. We just don't even have that concept. Um, but you go into America, and I've, I've lived in America long enough, and I've traveled enough in America to know, yeah, no, that's, I mean, the extremes of everyone bringing your AR-15 to church, of course, that's not normative. Right. But the concept of, no, but you've got an AR-15 at home, and it's to protect your family. And if someone broke into my house, and they're a non-Christian, and my family are Christians, but I'm protecting my family, I have no qualms shooting them in the head and sending them to eternal hell, which is my <laughs> theology. Over, yeah. you know, protecting my family who would all go to heaven. Um, right. No, no concept. No, not even a on the table discussion. It's just, duh, of course. You know, these kind of bubbles that we're in, I think, how, how do you go about challenging that? How do you go about exposing to an audience you're in a bubble? How do you go, do you know what I mean by this? I'm, I'm trying to think of the best way to... Well, yeah. I'll let you ramble around that topic and you'll probably hit the question I want to ask. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I I think travel is very important. Unfortunately, the coronavirus is uh, making that uh, impossible right now, but you can travel in other ways. I mean, you can travel by, I mean, it's so easy online or in books to travel outside of your tradition and to actually legitimately engage somebody who thinks differently from you. I think that's just such a healthy, um, uh, thing to do. And I purposely, like I even do that with my Facebook feed. I, I have people who just drive me around the bend of my Facebook feed, but I keep them in there because I want to constantly keep my finger on the pulse of what they're thinking. And I engage people like that because I, again, I want to, I want to understand and I want to know they're obviously seeing something I'm missing. So what is it? And, um, cause I've learned so much from engaging people who think very differently from me. Uh, you know, speaking and speaking of traveling, I remember promoting uh, Hellbound. I spent like three days in Manhattan and I jumped on a plane and I flew to Dallas and it was so shocking to get off the plane in Dallas. I've been there many times, but just in that moment to go, wow, I'm still in America. I mean, Dallas, the experience of living in Dallas is so different from being in Manhattan. Yeah. You know, some people pointed out that America is not one country. It's maybe five or seven countries because the regional diversity is just so stark. Like think about Louisiana, you know, the culture of Louisiana versus the culture of Seattle. I mean, it's, it, they might as well be in different countries. Absolutely. Um, and um, so it's very difficult to say anything about America in general mm. or American Christianity in general. And I live in Canada. Um, so we live, you know, right next to the United States. Of course, we're very fascinated with our Southern neighbors. We get inundated with American uh, movies, TV shows, you know, pop culture. So, and uh, <coughs> excuse me, throughout my film career, I've mostly um, worked on American funded films in America. Um, And so I have very few ties to the Canadian film industry, but it's really, you know, helped me, you know, I kind of say that a big part of my brain still lives in America. And I Mm. kind of think that way, but um, you know, in terms of uh, JES USA, yeah, there's this sense, there's this fortress mentality, the stand your ground mentality in the United States that has infiltrated Christianity. And it's, it's, um, you know, God guns, and government, you know, and, and it goes back to the founding myth of the country, which, um, 
is, you know, very much this idea that we need to stand against tyranny and, and, mm. and that actually the ability to stand against tyranny is a product of the gospel because what does the gospel do? What does Jesus do? He goes to people who are the subjects of tyrants yeah. and he, he does the worst great? possible thing. He says, you guys have value. Mm. That you're not just slaves, you're not just here to serve the government, um, that, that God sees you. He sees the, every hair on your head. You know, he values you more than anything. And that's the worst thing to tell for a tyrant to have somebody, somebody going around telling their subjects because, you know, yeah. you got to go, you got to crucify that guy. He's just, he's going to just disrupt the whole social order, um, which he did. And that's what they did. Um, and so there's something true about this American myth is that tyranny is bad and that it is right to stand against tyranny and mm. that people do have value. Um, but the problem is um, when violence enters the picture, because I'm a, you know, this film is very much inspired by Martin Luther King Jr. And, and uh, Martin Luther King is one of my heroes. And one, one of his pieces of writing was a speech he gave. It wasn't his official Nobel acceptance speech. It was a speech he gave, but within that process of w winning his Nobel Peace Prize. And he makes this argument in the speech that violence is both uh, impractical and immoral. Mm. And he says that, you know, I'm not unaware that violence has brought temporary success for some groups, you know, so you can perhaps use uh, a form of extraordinary violence to stop another form of violence from happening. Mm. But does it bring any lasting problems? What he argued is that it actually brings new and more complicated problems. You know, and, and you know, a canard that people always like to bring up is like, oh, shouldn't we have used violence to defeat the Nazis in World War II? And uh, as if World War II, the defeat of the Nazis led to victory. No, it didn't. We went immediately from World War II into World War III. People talk about World War III as if it's a future thing. It happened as soon as the armistice was signed because we immediately engaged in a Cold War with Russia that we are still living on the precipice of uh, mutually assured destruction, probably worse than ever. Um, mm -hmm. And so it didn't solve any problem. It, it, yeah. it, it created a new and much, much more complicated version of the problem. The same thing with defeating Al-Qaeda. What do you do when you defeat Al-Qaeda? You create ISIS, which is a new and more complicated version of yeah. ISIS. Because what happens is violence, this is something I got from Walter Wink, um, who I just wish was still alive, if only to be in my films. But I yeah. just, uh, just would love to engage with him. But he says, you know, violence is at its most dangerous when it succeeds. Because mm -hmm. violence, if it succeeds, then becomes a model. Oh, that's the way to make it in the world. We need to we need to do that, but we can't just do that. We have to new, do wow. a much more powerful version of that. And so we're just in this perpetual arms race. So as Martin Luther King says, violence is impractical because it it always sows the seeds of its own destruction. Of course, we go back to Jesus. He who lives by the sword or she dies by the sword. Um, but he also says it's immoral because mm -hmm. when people are defeated through violence, it's not like they just have this epiphany and go, oh, what were we thinking? We were so stupid. No, it dehumanizes and destroys them. It, it creates a hatred, a burning hatred that can last for generations. Look at the mm. Palestinian situation. I mean, that is like a multi-century hatred that's festering yeah. against the, the interlopers, you know, onto their land. Um, but it also dehumanizes the people who use the violence because the only way that you can use violence against another, another human being yeah. is if you somehow com compartmentalize in your mind. And, and what that means doing is you have to um uh what do you call it uh you have to basically shut down a part of your soul in order to pull the trigger in order to order the airstrike you have to reduce people to a target yep. and um we we can see in the suicide rates amongst servicemen and women and the mental health issues and the ptsd and all the things that people are suffering in horrific ways because of what they've done in yep. the defense of freedom um, so violence, it's impractical, it's immoral, it's, it, it presents no lasting solution to a problem. All it does is inch us closer and closer to self-destruction. Mm. And so this film, uh, JS USA, um, it, it asks the question of why then, if that's the truth, if violence is practical, if violence is immoral, if Jesus, um, rather, he was given every opportunity to use violence and to rise yeah. up 
and he refused it at every turn, eventually submitting himself to an act of state violence, collusion between the church and the state. Why on earth is nonviolence a minority position within Christianity? Mm. It should be the majority position. The exception should be people who are somehow finding a way to justify violence. And in fact, nonviolence was the majority position for the first three centuries of the church. And how could it not be? Because they were, Christians were the subjects of state violence, fighting for their lives. But it's so remarkable that within less than a decade of Christianity being made legal in the Roman Empire, Christians were already ordering the deaths, yeah. primarily of other Christians. Um, and so hmm. Christianity got co-opted by the interest of the state. And so what JES USA tries to help people see is how Christianity got co-opted by the state. And um, it also introduces uh, viewers to a minority of people, of Christians, who are working against that and trying to, in a sense, restore Christianity yeah. to the original vision. Yeah. Um, and I call it JES USA because, you know, you take these two things, Jesus and the United States, and they merge together where you can't even, you can't even pronounce it. That's why I spell it, because you know, what is it? I mean, yeah. there is a, a Spanish name, Jesusa, um, but uh, really JSUSA, you can't tell where one ends and the other begins. And really Jesusa, JSUSA is this God that emerges when you fuse religion and state into, it, it emerges in, into something horrifying. And um, uh, yeah, so the film tries to help people see how, you know, really, I'm not trying to say that the United States is bad or really even exceptional in the history yeah. of the world. They're, they're just the last great empire. And so what's happening there is the same thing that has happened ever since the days of Constantine. So why is it happening? And how can we reimagine Christianity and reimagine our roles as citizens in nations that have armies and that are engaged in military operations? Yeah. How can the Christians within those countries, trans first of all, transform themselves yeah. and to say no to violence, to say no to participation in this? Because I really, I think that's all we're ever called to do. Yeah. is is to is to be converted within and and then what happens is as we show we demonstrate a new way to form a community yeah. where violence is not the foundational principle the foundational principle is self sacrifice even to our enemies yeah. that transforms people we don't do it because oh that's oh, it's a new we don't introduce a new law this is the law the christians have to do it nonviolence is just it's it's not a it's not a value that should become this um this utopian ideal that we must practice or else we're not a real Christian. It's an outflow of loving unto death. Yeah. And it's, so that, yeah, we can't, that, that's just all it is. It's really, so it's a byproduct of, of following the two greatest commandments. Yeah. That's all. I, I wonder as well, you know, I'm, I'm aware we're, we're got time as well. So I want to wrap up in a bit, but um, I, I'm so intrigued by, um, my understanding from my very limited studies in this is that it within American um, uh, general populace, if you take a snapshot of who is pro um, uh, going to war in foreign nations to try and bring peace, uh, if you're asking who is pro uh, torture of enemy combatants, who is pro uh, death penalty, um, who is pro go on and on and on with those lists of violences when you uh, when you compare christian populace to non-christian populace it's the christians that are more pro these violent positions than actually the non-christians and and something I've, I've wondered for a few years now is we uh, for for a lot of us certainly for me growing up it was hammered into us so much that the worldly position is evil that the worldly position is this backsliding or this uh, uh, this satanic or you know it's just they, they, if the world believes that it's evil if the world believe evolution well they're definitely wrong if the world believe you know this they're definitely wrong the world sleep together before they get married the world these are all worldly positions and something I come across a lot when I'm dealing with you know someone like evangelicals because whatever the language I don't want to just hone in on just on evangelicals because I think there's a lot of Christianity beyond evangelicalism that falls into this category. Um, and also there's a lot of evangelicals outside of America that are not like this at all, uh, as right. well, you know, um, uh, but when a group of Christians has been so indoctrinated to see what the worldly position is, is almost always going to be bad, negative, ungodly, unbiblical, et cetera, et cetera. 
And the, the general populace is going, you know, I'm not sure killing people is making things better. I'm not sure yeah. having a retributive, um, uh, uh, you know, a punitive uh, prison system is, is better. It seems from the data, we'd be much better off with some sort of restorative prison system. You know, that would be much better. Let's do restorative justice. And we go, oh, no, 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 no that'll never work. That'll never work. That's, that's world clear. How do we go about challenging that? You know, it, it feels like, it almost feels like the, the <laughs> somehow in some way shape or form what jesus came to do was reform uh reform this world and bring transformation and bring the kingdom of god to this world and somehow yeah. the ambassadors of that have become the actual problem not the people that are carrying the message uh well, you know the, the non-christians yeah. aren't the problem in a sense in, in a lot of ways um, of this well, issue I, yeah and i think it's to be fair like you say it's not all christians it's not all evangelicals like i was raised uh, you know, a good part of my life within a Mennonite church and Mennonites are devoted to pacifism, to restorative justice. In fact, in Canada, especially on the, on the East coast, like for instance, the Mennonites have uh, over the last 20 years pioneered something called circles of concern. Um, mm -hmm. So what they do is when a, a, a sex offender is released from prison, the recidivism rate is very, very high, um, the rate of reoffense. And so what they do is they form a circle of concern around these pariahs of society in the eyes of most people. And they found that uh, the sex offenders who are surrounded by these circles of people who hold them accountable, who support them, who employ them and all that sort of thing. The level of recidivism is just a fraction of what it is amongst uh, the general population. So these are, this is a great example of Christians acting out of their faith. Many of them believe in hell, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but they're acting out of their faith um, to try and uh, reduce the level of violence in the world and also to redeem and restore people who uh, many people just consider to be irredeemable. So I think there's, there's, you can always look around and see really good examples and really bad examples. But you're right, though. I mean, I know there was a famous study, I can't remember who did it, uh, several years ago that said evangelical Christians were, especially white evangelicals, were at the forefront of those who supported torture and who supported war. And, uh, you know, we all know Billy Graham is always up there praying for, you know, the president Next and stuff. During, during, yeah. And so... There's definitely examples of that. And, but there's also conservative Catholics who are in very similar, uh, conservative Orthodox Christians. So, you know, within every church, every church tradition, there's going to be, you know, those types of people. But um, yeah, so you, you definitely don't want to um, uh, whitewash it or sorry, like paint everybody with the same brush. Um, boy, there's something else that was on the cusp of my uh, mind there. Just uh, remind me you were, you were addressing this issue of, uh, oh yeah. So, evangelicals tend to support this type of thing. Mm. Uh, I know what I was going to say is I'm a big fan of Sam Harris. I listen to his podcast all the time okay. and uh, he has, you know, he is uh, an advocate of, of stuff like waterboarding um, and that sort of thing, because he says, look at, if you have this guy who knows when this bomb is going to go off, that's going to kill a hundred thousand people, um, you know, put this on the scale one guy getting waterboarded, 100,000 people being killed. Mm -hmm. Why on earth would you not waterboard this guy to find out where the bomb is so you can stop it? It would be evil not to. That's a tough thing for me to respond to. Yeah. It really is because yep. it's, uh, I mean, so are you going to sacrifice 100,000 people because you don't want to violate your precious ideal? Yeah. It's a very, very weighted trolley problem, right? I mean, you've got literally yeah. tons and tons of people dying, one guy getting waterboarded. It's not even, yeah, you know, it's one not, it's not even gonna, <laughs> he, he might have some long term psychological damage, but he's not, you know, he's not gonna die. It's gonna be awful, but, you know, he's gonna make it. Yeah. Do you waterboard the guy? Um, yeah. You know, that's a, that's a very tough real world question. But I, I will say this is that, you know, a lot of people who, are pacifists or who believe in nonviolence are criticized because they'll people will say what you're just gonna you know somebody breaks into your home you're just gonna let your wife and children die but the the truth is everybody is willing to sacrifice someone else for what they believe it doesn't matter if you believe in war because if you believe in war you're willing to sacrifice soldiers you also know that every act of war has collateral damage men women children old people who are going to suffer and die because of your violent actions, but you factor that in, there's a certain level of that you deem acceptable. You're willing to sacrifice people for your mm -hmm. views. So a pacifist is no different. The difference really is that they're actually willing to sacrifice themselves first um, yeah. in order to, not just for the sake of their ideal, but in the hope that doing so will open the eyes of the 
of the person who's bringing violence against him in the same way the Christian centurion. I think he's one of the most important people in the Bible mm. where he looks at Jesus and says, surely this man was the son of God. Here's a guy who's possibly, you know, he's obviously involved in some form in the crucifixion. He's a tool of the state who comes to this awareness through an act of self-sacrifice. Nobody preached to him. He just watched it happen. And so I think we have to believe that us, being willing to sacrifice ourselves sooner or later, it weighs on the mind of those who are using violence. And, mm. and we have to believe that within every human being, except maybe a very small minority of sociopaths or, who are maybe bored without a capacity for empathy, and that is by far the minority of human beings yeah. on this planet, um, that we can call out to that, that within someone else. And that's what, you know, Ashita Moore, who's uh, a uh, pastor in Greg Boyd's church in uh, in uh, Minnesota, um, she says that in JSUSA that our goal is to call out to that spark of the divine within other people. You know that to call out their humanity through our act, and and uh, you know the way you, you, it's very hard to do that when you're pointing a gun at that person. Yeah. Um, but when you don't, <laughs> when you don't play the script, when you respond to someone's act, again, we just go back to like Jesus says, if somebody slaps you on one cheek, turn the other cheek as well, because you instantly put them in a position where, you know, if they, yeah. if they have to slap you with their unclean hand, they now have to stop and think about what they're doing. Yeah. You just it's not doing up. nothing. It's just no. not responding in kind. And I think it's that's a big distinction it, for pacifism, yeah. isn't it? I mean, and, right. and there is a pacifism that is doing nothing. Um, you know, but yeah, there's a totally different option as well on the table that very few people ever entertain. They just see it as a, an extreme, oh, you're just going to say, oh yes, please rape and kill my family. You know, <laughs> that's not probably <laughs> how pacifists will progress. That's not their next step on the to-do list, you know? Um, right. Well, and it's, 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 uh, yeah. And that's why I hate the term pacifism because it sounds like mm, passiveism. It does. Um, yeah. I like creative nonviolence, but again, it's, it's kind of using a negative, but it's not, I, you know, I'm a big fan of René Girard and uh, yeah. he talks about mimetic theory where we tend, you know, what is the deepest truth about humans is that we imitate. Um, and so the key thing is not to, to imitate or mirror the violence that's brought against you, is to respond in a different way. There's, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of creative responses to violence um, that uh, can actually break the chain. You know, like, uh, the, the, you know, think about what we're all enduring with the coronavirus right now. Yeah. We're, uh, you know, oftentimes we fight drugs with violence, antibiotics. Well, what does that do? That actually creates an arms race in, in, in that the bugs eventually respond. What we're doing right now with the coronavirus is we're practicing nonviolence. <laughs> is we're starving it. Is yeah. that we're, we're not coming against it with powerful drugs. We're breaking the chain yeah. of transmission. And so that's exactly right. what we all need to do. Is, and so think about if all the Christians in Germany in World War II in the, well, before World War II, in the 1920s, in the 1930s, when Hitler's coming to power, if every Christian had broken the chain of violence in Germany, who does yeah. Hitler have to recruit? Because everybody in the country, technically, yeah. is a Christian. <laughs> no, they had to register. So, I mean, if Christians alone would just break the chain the same way we're trying to break the chain of transmission of coronavirus, the problem very quickly takes care of itself. And not just Christians, Muslims are also called to not be violent. Yeah, absolutely. So if every Muslim would just agree to break the chain of violence, Jews are called not to be violent, to welcome the foreigner, um, you know, to, to, and the alien in their land. So if every single human being just says, I'm not gonna be a carrier of this disease, mm. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna break the chain. I'm not gonna transmit it. Um, and so that's really what I think, um, you know, Christianity, what Jesus is ultimately calling us to is to, you know, you need to fight the battle within your own self. So if you can practice nonviolence, I have a family, my wife, four kids, if we can be a nonviolent household, which we have been, you know, we've never struck our kids. Um, if we can practice nonviolence in the community where I live, you know, it just, it just keeps moving out. It's not complicated. Um, and but, you know, so if we could all be faithful to that tradition within our religious traditions, I think, um, you know, but, but again, there's a lot of fears that get in the way. There's um, anger that gets in the way. There's resentment. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of different things that we have to deal with emotionally um, to, to get there. But, you know, I would just, you know, want to call people 
to work on that. You know, um, why live out of your dysfunction and hurt and pain and anger? Um, you know, like uh, it's, uh, you know, that saying about, I don't know if it was Gandhi or who said it, but, you know, you know, holding on to that is like drinking poison, expecting the other person to die. Yeah. Um, and yet when you're in the midst of it, that's all you want to do is just like, give me more yeah. of that poison. Big just, glass of poison, please. <laughs> <laughs> let me like hook let me up to an IV yeah. because <laughs> you know what that anger makes you feel is you, it reinforces that you were a victim. And so there's that sense of being justified. Yeah. And I think a lot of violence comes from that too, right? Is that what you see in a lot of violent situations mm -hmm. is competing victim narratives. And mm -hmm. so violence was brought against me. Therefore I am now, I actually occupy the moral high ground now. So when yeah. I'm going to use violence, it's actually good when I yeah. use violence yeah. because I'm doing it for the right thing. And so you'll see that happening all the time. You know, even the United States, the most powerful country in the world will portray itself as a victim, mm -hmm. you know? And so therefore they can use all the violence they want because they're using it for good reasons. And we bless it mm. because we all kind of share that mentality. And, and so, yeah, I think that's one of the, the most pervasive forces in the world. And, and that's why I come back, you know, Rene Girard to me is so important because yeah he brings an awareness of what we're doing into our minds and he he makes us aware of how we're using scapegoats and we're using scapegoats to to tell a myth to tell a lie to ourselves about our violence and we're saying no 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 the source of our problems is out there in the world we need to go out we need to find it we need to get rid of it and that could be someone within our community or it could be someone who's outside our community who's threatening it but we just need to go and find that thing that group of people we need to destroy it when, you know, that's just an excuse to avoid looking at, at what's yeah. going on within. Yeah. Uh, you just keep doing that until you whittle down your group. So it's just you and one other person, you're going to have to scapegoat them and then you're left on your own. You're still going to have the issue. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. If, it's, yeah. As little as we can whittle down the world's population in that way. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's where I think I really like this whole rise. In, I, I like this rise in mindfulness. You know, some people might see it as a, as a trend, but I, you know, especially Sam Harris's approach to it, he says, you know, mm -hmm. that there's all this stuff going on in your mind that you're not aware of it. So what is mindfulness, mindfulness doing? It's, it's, it's listening. There's this stream of, of river of things moving through your mind all the time. And it's mm -hmm. unconsciously determining your event, you know, your, your actions. So, you know, Sam talks a lot about anger, you know, and he, you know, he's very um, skeptical of the idea of free will. And I am as well. Like, how can a will act freely, free of what? I mean, are you saying that you make decisions that aren't determined by prior decisions? Like, what are you acting free of? Um, mm -hmm. you, your will is always a response to something else, but rarely do we know what it is. But spending time being mindful, um, you know, looking within is, is, is just so important. So I'm glad to mm -hmm. see that even though that idea has largely disappeared from within a lot of faith traditions, it's reemerged within, you know, somebody like Sam Harris, who he, he probably doesn't quite call himself an atheist, but he's very, very skeptical yep. agnostic. And yet he just sees that this is an important human need. If we're yeah. going to have uh, a world where we can actually survive as a race and a species. So I'm excited to, to see that type of thing. Yeah, no, it's, it's really my main audience uh, are people that are coming out of um, maybe more traditional models of Christianity and exploring new ideas and, and mindfulness is one of the most uh, popular paths to take when you start deconstructing these ideas of who is God and what is God and what is Jesus and you know, what, what is this faith? Well, what happens is when you start to take apart all these different concepts and parts of God is you end up with no one to pray to. <laughs> you know, so you go, well, who do I pray to now? And, and, and so when you lose the, the, the second person of, of God, you know, this, there's the third person of God, which is God everywhere and in everything. And it, it just is, um, uh, or the, the, the third person, sorry, uh, second person. And then this third person of like, there's God, he's sitting in a chair in front of you almost. You can close your eyes and picture the old guy with the beard and talk to him. When you get rid of that, you, you either have to go, to everything and explore God in everything, you know, this mm -hmm. kind of panentheism, not pantheism necessarily, but yeah. Um, or you go within and you have to find the fact that, that God is within that, and, and, and that every thought, that every 
ounce of your being is being held together by this cosmic Christ, this universal Christ that holds all things together, that is in all things, that spoke all things together. And that's the path that a lot of people take. So I think it's really, a, it's an awakening um, that is happening across the world that people are starting to go deeper um, within rather than to look out. And I think that's a well, huge difference. But I, but I think also going within causes you to look out too. And, 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 and so what you start to see um, is that, your perspective on the world is is but one of billions mm. and that that in a sense we are all the product of a of because of consciousness who on earth even knows what it is nobody knows but we consciousness is emerging somehow through every human being but it's always a limited perspective and i think what mindfulness does is help you understand how limited your perspective is and so yeah. it creates a desire to want to engage other people specifically people who see things really differently from you because yeah. it's so important to get all these perspectives on reality. Um, yeah. And it's, it's exciting to get these perspectives. It's not threatening because their, their perspective can't negate mine. It can only add to it. Yeah. And so if we start to look at other people that way, that it's not a zero sum game, it's a win win that if I engage somebody who thinks very differently from me, I'm adding to my perspective. I'm not, mm. I don't have anything to fear about them negating my perspective or delegitimizing mine. There's a mutual exchange. Um, and so it's an exciting thing to do. And so again, like I said, like, and, and like you're pointing out, I mean, uh, once you walk away from religion, um, some kind of an official form of religion, you know, I think that need remains. And, and I think that's what religion mm -hmm. is doing by and large. It's giving us perspective on ourselves. And, um, and, you know, somehow, yeah, it, comparing it to God, but if you take God away, well, then what do we compare ourselves to? Yeah. And I find, you know, I'm more and more, you know, kind of in line with a, what you would call apophatic theology from the world of Eastern Orthodoxy is where we can only really say what we don't know. Um, and that's really how we have to define God is in the negative space of what we mm -hmm. don't know. And just assume that, you know, I mean, how can you not assume once you just explore the universe that we don't know anything when 98% of the mass of the universe or some huge amount is called dark matter and dark energy? Boy, those yep. are really, really <laughs> specific scientific terms. That's an admission of ignorance. And that should be a humbling yeah. admission yeah. Um, that we haven't even we're all we're seeing of the universe is like looking at a city at night and we're just seeing the lights. We have no idea what is be in the darkness, you know, mm. and so again, that should lead to humility, but it should also lead to excitement. And, yeah. and again, we all, I'm not immune to this. I, you know, we all get emotionally engaged in an idea. You can't reason outside of your emotional processes. And I think emotion is so important to reasoning because that just like gets you excited to learn and to grow, but it can also blind you, you know? And yeah. so as my good friend, Ron Dart says, uh, he, I think he points this out in Hellbound is that every reading of a text, it reveals some things and conceals others. And so we tend to make the mistake of getting so excited at what we're seeing that we forget that in order to see that thing, we have to suppress vast amounts of information. It's mm. the same way if I'm, you know, working with a camera, if I'm putting on a lens, a 45 millimeter lens, which is great for interviews, it brings my foreground into very sharp focus, but it creates a bokeh, it blurs the background. Um, if I move the tripod, it does the opposite. So we're doing that all the time. We're putting on lenses that allow us to see some things really clearly. But we have to remember that in order to see those things clearly, we had to suppress a whole bunch of information, mm -hmm. which other people are really intently focused on right now. Yeah. And so they're seeing something we're missing. So if we can just, you know, it's like a daily reminder. We need to keep reminding ourselves of that is that I'm, I'm seeing some things, I'm missing other things. And sometimes what I'm missing is more important than what I'm seeing. So if somebody else is like sounding the alarm on something I'm missing, I should listen. Even yep. though sometimes I really don't want to yeah. listen. <laughs> well, I mean, none of us like to like to think that our whole world is not the most important thing in the world. Yeah. You know? No, yeah. Uh, so you're going to battle anger. You're going to battle resistance. Also, when you publicly invest yourself in a certain position, especially if you're driving a livelihood from it, mm. oh boy, that is that is not a good feeling when you start to realize, oh crap, you know, uh, uh, this is this, this is not good. You know, I, that's why I think David, I see people resisting David Bentley Hart's book, uh, that I'll, that I'll shall be saved yeah. where I think he just like, it's the death knell to a lot of things, not just Phenomenal. eternal conscious torment in hell, but just to so many abhorrent ideas of God. And he doesn't like 234 pages with a lot of snark and sarcasm. 
which I love about him, by the way. Yeah. Because uh, he also has a sense of humor, if you're willing to listen for it. Uh, it's either I see people just resisting him um, so strongly yeah. because he is such it's a hand grenade that's just landed. Everyone's staring at it, just terrified of when it's going to explode because yeah. it means the end of what they've built their entire careers on. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's terrifying. Yeah. It's, it is. It's terrifying. I experienced this in the sense of, I mean, I used to travel and speak in charismatic conferences and churches and do this all the time. And that was my, my day in day out. And I started to go, oh, I just don't know what I believe anymore. I'm not really entirely sure I believe half of this. And I went through a whole spiraling downward spiral or upward spiral. I don't know what way I was spiraling, but I was spiraling. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and I found myself going, I'm going to have to keep saying things I don't even believe so I can keep paying the bills. Yeah. Um, and I, I ultimately came to the point where going, well, I'm not going to do that. I'll happily go get a job at the supermarket or something and just say what I want to say. Um, but the, the fear and the, and, and the realization of like, wow, this is, I think that this is such a holy and divine and perfect, completely isolated thing, the truth. And then I suddenly realized, oh, it's so interwoven with actually me being safe, me paying the bills, me having a house, me, me being yeah. accepted by people. It's, there's a lot of stuff interwoven here that allows us to see things certain ways that, um, that doesn't allow us to see other things. And I think people are genuinely blind to see things that will cost them too much. You know, it's the way that yeah. the brain is not wired for truth, it's wired for safety. And so yeah. it will yeah. literally say, nope, if it hears something that makes it unsafe. It, it just doesn't, it's in one ear and out the other. Um, I think I think you made a really good point there. My brother-in-law, uh, Todd, uh, he uh, he says that's the choice we're always making between truth and security, mm. and we choose we choose security most of the time. But as you say, we're wired by evolution to choose that. Yeah, I mean, uh, you we're know, there's fighting a, of, a battle not to. Well, and you know, I've just recently read some uh, you know studies that basically kind of prove that that you know our brain is an illusion can often serve us better than the truth you know mm. so if we see a stick and we think it's a snake better to err on the side of caution if we're you yep. know a primitive person <laughs> wandering the plains you know and so we tend to evolve people who are more likely to react that way survive because they avoid yep. more snakes than people who don't yeah and so we're fighting our biology i think yeah. and, no 100 percent and the idea that we involve we we also evolved within very small groups and what is the number one a prime directive of these small groups wandering the savannah it's it's the survival of the group yeah. and so when somebody comes against the group the best thing you can do or somebody a stranger appears the best mm -hmm. thing you do is just kill that person yeah because you don't know are they scouting out your territory on behalf of someone else well you don't want them going back and telling them so just kill them and that's yeah. largely what primitive people did um or if they if they learn of someone else, the best thing you can do is go and conquer them and take them over because the prime directive is survival. And we unfortunately inherit the biology of that killer mm. who killed. Uh, we're we're the descendants of the people who did it best, you know. Yeah. And so we're fighting that, um, you know, with our ideas. And so I think we have to be gracious to ourselves and recognize that's what's going on, and um, and yet be conscious of that all the time. And, yeah. uh, you know, I just think if we, the more mindful we are of that, and maybe I'm naive, again, I'm a hopeful, you know, I remember once I had a girlfriend who referred to me as a naive optimist. And it's like, well, okay. It's a great that. thing to be called, right? At the end of the day, what compliment. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I'm naive, but I am optimistic. <laughs> um, but I kind of maybe naively think that people will see this and go, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, let's, let's abandon these, these, uh, crazy self-destructive, this crazy self-destructive addiction yeah. to violence. It's hard to do yeah. when everybody's standing in a circle pointing a gun at everyone. Um, who's going to lower the gun first? Because that person's probably going to mm -hmm. die. You know, uh, maybe by the time third, fourth, fifth person in the circle gets killed, the other people might go, wait a second. If we yeah. keep this up, we're all going to die. <laughs> maybe, we, maybe we should stop. So the first person who says, I'm going to break the chain, they're, they're going to pay the ultimate price for that. And that's, you know, what we talk about in JES USA is that, you know, somebody has got to stop this merry-go-round, but nonviolence, it's a horrible self-preservation plan. Yeah. It's most likely going to go the opposite direction, but do you actually believe that, do you believe number one in the resurrection? Mm. Do you believe that somehow and you may understand that literally figuratively, but 
will something be born out of your sacrifice that will lead to a greater good? Yeah. Um, and uh, because ultimate, yeah. So you're not going to save yourself. You may not save your loved ones, but your act will echo down through history in the same yeah. way that the Christians who stood up to the Roman state um, and refused to join its armies, who, who submitted to the, the, the lions in the forum, um, their actions have echoed down through history. Eventually, you know, it, it, they overtook the whole Roman Empire. So again, we, we live in a world where we want to see an immediate like and follow with everything that we do. Um, but that's just not yeah. the way this works. And it's a horrible thing. I'm terrified by the conclusion of my work of, of, the, of JSUSA yeah. because of what it means and what it calls me to do. And I'm not sure if I have the courage to completely even follow the conclusion of my own film, but that's something I try to strive toward every day. Um, yeah. And I, I would hope other people who watch the film feel the same way. That's terrified. Cool. <laughs> yeah but hope, yeah. but hopeful but hopeful yeah yeah no that's that's really beautiful kevin thank you so much this has been honestly fantastic i'd love to have you on again at some point to talk but also I, I feel like there's so many things we could have got into that would have been like total <laughs> like um did, yeah who knows what kind of little paths we could have got off on but um i really really appreciate it uh, I, so people can check out JES USA. It's, it's on, I, I got it on Vimeo. Is that the best place to get it right now? Yeah. So unfortunately we've run into some hiccups with our distribution due to the coronavirus in part. So we are eventually going to be on Google play, Amazon, iTunes, all that sort of thing. But for the moment it's available on Vimeo on demand. Um, and uh, it's available worldwide. You can buy it, you can stream it. We priced it low. It's only four ninety nine US or, t or nine ninety or to rent nine ninety nine to buy. You can download it. Um, but yeah, so Vimeo on demand, you can, um, also check out our website, jesusafilm.com and, uh, you get buying links there. Just find out a little bit more about us. Of course, we're on Facebook, Twitter, um, you know, all these different social media places. So yeah. Is that so the best place for, if people want to connect with you in any way, shape or form, is that the best way to do it through Twitter, through Facebook, these kind of platforms? Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Cool. So look, and the tag J J S U S A film. Uh, you can find us there. Uh, awesome. and yeah, they'll lead you to us somewhere or another. Right. Well, thank you so much. Honestly, it's been wonderful. Uh, thank you. Yeah. It's, yeah. I love these kinds of discussions. So thank you very much.